and welcome to this, the next keynote lecture for the Develop Your A-Level Teaching Programme. My name is Hannah Doonan. I am an assistant head teacher and the director of sixth form at the Green School Trust. And this session is going to focus on how we develop reading in our subjects to be more academic and scholarly. Essentially, how do we support our students in tackling those difficult articles that they have to read in order to be able to read around their subject and develop a more critical um, and academic view of the topics that they're handling in lessons. Um, but firstly, before we move on, I'd just like to first thank everybody who was involved in the last keynote and the last breakout sessions. Um, I've heard some excellent feedback, both from facilitators and from people who attended. And I'd just like to thank everybody for their hard work, including Emma behind the scenes, um, but all of the people that contributed to the um, to the keynote itself, all of the facilitators and all of the participants. I really hope that it was useful for you and that you've all, all been able to go away and actually try out some of those oracy strategies and implement some of them in your lessons. I know that I went and observed a lesson just yesterday um, with one of our teachers who um, was doing some debating and some discussion work, which she doesn't normally do. She was quite nervous about doing it. And it was actually really, really excellent. The students engaged so well and the conversations they were having were at that next level because they were having to draw on um, some of the um, theories that they've learned about in order to be able to support their actual arguments and their actual discussions in a debate type situation. So it's really, really promising to see and I hope that that's happening in lots of your schools. Today, as I've said, we move on to how we develop reading and focusing in particular on how we support students in accessing academic reading. Um, so we did some student voice and we asked students why they find it difficult or what they find difficult about academic reading, what puts them off. And we also spoke to some of the students who perhaps are more successful at doing it and asked them how they tackle it, how they approach it and break it down in order to make it manageable. Um, after we've done the student voice, obviously we sent all of that information out to some of our experts in the field. And I'm really pleased to say that Monica Esselin Pierce from Gumley and Johnny Mitchell from Reach are actually going to be delivering uh, this keynote today. They've both got some really, really excellent things to say about reading, how we should approach it as teachers, what we should think about it, and most importantly, how we can break it down and make it accessible for the students. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Monica. I hope you enjoy it. I think it's a really useful keynote, and I'm sure that your breakout sessions will be just as informative. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Welcome to this keynote speech for the Hounslow Educational Partnership about developing reading academically for our sixth form students. I'm Monica Eslin Peard, I'm head of year 12 and the EPQ Centre Coordinator at Gumley. This is what we're going to be covering today and very shortly you're going to hear from our students talking about the challenges of stepping up to academic reading in the sixth form. Then I'm going to take you through some rec recent academic findings about the impact of the lockdown on reading and then address the challenges that face us as teachers. Then there'll be a case study about the EPQ and our students will share their thoughts about how the EPQ has helped them with their studies overall. So we know our students may not be reading enough but what are the challenges they face? Let's hear from three of our students. So can you tell us a little bit more about the struggle that young people face when they have to read more academically at A-level? Mm -hmm. um, so I think the struggle that a lot of people face, especially reading academic articles, is not understanding and not knowing straight away. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people do, when they don't understand, they just stop there because, you know, I don't get it first time. But that's not the case. It's just because you haven't been exposed to this earlier on that this struggle shows up. So I think what people should do is, if you don't understand something, just break it down or maybe look up the words or phrases that you don't get and then read the article again. Mm -hmm. That way you'll understand it better mm -hmm. and then you'll, f you'll see that, you know what, actually, I do get it. There's nothing you do like in GCSE or reading journals and articles by professionals, which obviously know a lot more than you do about the subject content. So it was just the words, the formats, the kind of trying to find the key information within like on a hundred page a journal so it was it was kind of like knowing where to begin I think was the hardest bit 
Um, at first, it was really overwhelming, and I thought that I wouldn't be able to take it on. But now, I decided to really like dissect it by making notes and trying to understand what I'm reading, and it's helped me immensely. So, what's the current state of play with academia? What are the scholars telling us the impact of lockdown is? Well. Many of you are already familiar with the fact that COVID has resulted not only in learning loss, but the widening of the learning gap among students. And Darmody Smith and Russell suggest that we need to formulate a long-term plan that redresses social inequalities in education. It's not just a short fix. And Holt quite rightly says that young people should be included in this planning. Because if we don't do that, the resulting learning loss may have long term negative effects on the education and the life choices of young people. So how much do they read? Well, if you're reading for five minutes a day, that's 400,000 words a year. And if you get up to 40 minutes a day, that's 3,646,000 words a year. Now, clearly there is a massive gap there and there may be some young people who are not reading at all. And so look, this is what we face. These are Quigley's thoughts. So what are the things that really get in the way? Well, if you don't know what you're reading about, you're gonna be put off straight away. If the words are difficult, you don't want to do it. Um, you might find that sentence length and syntax is difficult. And these are just some of the ideas. If you like, what we're seeing now is the tip of the iceberg. That 10% is what we see, but the 90% under the water is the really important part that we as teachers need to react to. We know that if they are reading in the sixth form, they tend to read fiction. They're not too keen on non-fiction. And for some of them, they may actually be, have quite low levels of literacy. So they'll be reading manga. They're frustrated about reading, and well, so are we. But we need to prepare them not only for their A-levels and their BTECs and other Key Stage 5 courses, but we need to prepare them for life, whether that's university or job interviews or apprenticeships. Um, especially because of the pandemic, people have been home a lot and they haven't gotten the support from like teachers or their peers, and they also haven't had the resources to read. Mm -hmm. And especially when you're reading on your own and mm -hmm. it's quite difficult terminology, you don't get it first time. And if you don't have that support, a lot of people do stop right there. So during those lockdowns, um, I would just time myself for 20 minutes and then I would build it on and just carry on read it like I will turn the alarm off and then just read and read for more than like 20 minutes and it became hours. So one of the things we've been thinking about is how levels of literacy relate to subjects. So linguists, people doing English and history, they're actually pretty literate and they like reading. That's my three or multiple cacti but they might not want to go outside their comfort zone. The ology subjects, sociology, psychology, one cactus. They're not really used to long texts, particularly not texts with specific technical vocabulary, and they might not be reading that much for pleasure or learning. Meanwhile, there's an empty pot. That's for scientists, economists, mathematicians, all the creative hearts. They will think, huh, my, my subject doesn't really involve a lot of essay writing, so why do I need to bother to read? But look at this, this is what we're expecting. We're expecting sophisticated essays from them, essays that synthesize different views, that produce critical arguments. And yes, I think that's a bit of a monster. We've put a dragon in their midst and we have to address how they can tame the dragon and write fluently and eloquently. So let's look at some of the tips that come out of our experience. We tell them all not to use Wikipedia. They know they can't copy and paste, but how do we get them to love reading around their topics and to really fall in love with the challenges of reading academic papers? 
Well, let's start with the EPQ. As many of you will know, the extended project qualification combines reflective practice in the form of a weekly reflection on talk sessions with independently driven academic research. And in most cases, the output is a 5,000 word academic paper and 10 to 15 minute presentation. So we're dealing both with literacy and oracy here. And now they're going to tell you what they've discovered. So what were the challenges for you at the beginning of your EPQ with academic reading and specialist vocabulary? Um, so when I started my EPQ, I was doing the topic of sexualisation of women. But when I was reading it, I found lots of the vocabulary was really complex. So I would try to look it up, but I just realised that it would just be too hard for me to form my own opinions and like write a whole EPQ on it. So what was the solution? What did you do differently to get over that problem? Um, so I ended up choosing a different topic, but even when even with my new topic, when I did find like complicated words, I would always um, highlight them and make sure I wrote down the definition so I could refer back to it. Um, like I would never just skip over it because you won't be able to fully understand um, what you're reading if you don't understand each word. So I picked an EPQ topic that was about AI, artificial intelligence in law. And there was a lot of um, tricky vocabulary that I had to come to terms with in the beginning. So I think what really helped me was um, kind of highlighting the words that I didn't understand. And often, like in academic papers, they'd like have footnotes as to like the definitions of each word, and um, just like going through them and then yeah, rereading the stuff that I didn't understand. I think the first time you get an academic paper, it can look like a foreign language. Now, apologies to those of you who don't speak German, but in my experience as an academic researcher, German musicians and music education specialists are particularly proud of using abstruse vocabulary. I find it difficult to deal with this and I'm bilingual. So what's it like when you're in year 12 and you're reading your first paper? Well. We, we encourage all of them to put proper references at the top of A5 record cards. We encourage them to put page numbers in all the time as they're note taking, whether they're paraphrasing or whether they're quoting directly. And the real key is to start with the abstract, go straight to the conclusion, then read the introduction. And if it's relevant, go on. If it isn't, put it to one side, but record it in your critical reading log. How do you actually go about breaking down one of those 5,000 word papers? So I look at like the topic and then I look at, I look at each of the topics and then I make notes on it. And the thing, the thing about it, cause there's so many pages, it's really, like, it's really overwhelming. But what I tend to do is just look at it topic by topic and like just by the titles, and then I look at the paragraphs and then just dissect it, try to, to memorize it and then get my flashcards and make notes on it. It was very time consuming because I had to be able to find each individual section of the academic paper that actually interested me, was actually relevant to my research, rather than reading through the entire thing and just making a bunch of notes and a lot of stuff that might not have actually been relevant to my question. So academic reading, I think it's kind of just practice makes perfect. you just got to constantly make yourself aware with different types of academic readings. So, you know, I read journals, I read articles, I read books, and all those kind of helped with my understanding of how to read an academic paper. You know, I kind of began with highlighting, so I think that's the best way to do it. You highlight bits that you understand, because obviously you don't highlight the stuff you don't understand. Um, and then you kind of make notes on that. But I think it's always good to highlight first, read through the article before you actually make the notes so you actually get a clearer idea of what the article is actually trying to say. Here's another set of tactics from Beale, which we really like. This works brilliantly in subjects like government and politics. So for each paragraph, we ask students to give that paragraph a title and then try and summarise the content of that paragraph in two to three bullet points. If you're walking around a class, you can see very quickly who's got the hang of it and who may be struggling, even if they can get a title, they might be struggling with 
doing those two to three bullet points just because they're overwhelmed by vocabulary, say. Another way of looking at it is with color analysis. So here we've got different colors for different aspects, red for context, blue for the terms of the content, and the justification, the proof points, if you like, are in green. And another way to use Cornell notes, which you might not have thought about, is to use them to generate questions about, say, watching a podcast, a TV documentary, or reading an article from The Economist. If they focus on the questions, you can also see whether they are interrogating the content in an appropriate way. In other words, are they developing critical thinking skills? And another way of doing it is high five academic reading. Now, I really like this because it's on your, the fingers of your hand. This takes a bit more resilience. So this might be something we would introduce in the second term in year 12. So you need some pre-reading. When you're reading, you may ask questions. You should be thinking about what is in the source material and questioning, what does it mean? What do I think? Do I have a different view? What about the vocabulary? Is it making a judgment? Can you cope with the grammatical aspects? If not, highlight and ask your teacher. Again, we come back to the idea of bullet pointing the main ideas in each paragraph. And at the end, it's a really good idea to make your own summary of the text. What has the benefit been of learning to do that academic reading? But in terms of the academic reading, I now know how to kind of synthesise a long article into something a lot shorter, because obviously when you're writing your coursework, you can't write the whole article, you have to summarise, and that's something which I learned from academic reading. they kind of highlighting and understanding the key parts and then putting that into your coursework. So by overcoming these challenges, I've really been able to come up with more comprehensive answers to any questions that I come across. I'm able to make more balanced arguments. I'm allowed to really think about how valid the data that I'm looking at is, um, how much it can be applied to situations, and pros and cons is definitely something I've been able to refine. My vocabulary is increased as well. I'm able to apply these words that I've learned about in my work, in my essays, and it's just helped me become better at my essay writing, especially in geography, which is really, really useful and gets me in the high band. I would advise people who were scared of doing the EPQ to just go for it, take the risk, because you don't know what the future holds for you initially. So initially I was really scared. I had no clue. I still don't have any clue of what I'm doing, but you just have to take the risk because you never know what the outcome is going to be. And if, like, this is still what I'm taking on. If I don't know what I'm going to do, and if it doesn't go according to plan, at least I've still learned, I've learned something, especially how to work at, like, an undergraduate level. So finally, where are we going? I think COVID is going to haunt us, or perhaps excite us, because of the challenge it brings us as teachers to find ways to support, stretch, and allow our students to really achieve their academic goals. We all need to act to raise levels of literacy, and I'm sure that together we can do this as a team. Thanks, Monica. I'm Johnny. I'm a teacher of mathematics and the head of academic studies at Reach Academy Felton, which means I I'm the EPQ coordinator here and oversee other parts of our academic enrichment. So to answer this question and a number of these questions that Monica has alluded to, I did some reading from the literacy paper by the Education Endowment Foundation, The Secret of Literacy by David Diddow and Reading Reconsidered by Doug Lamov, all about how we can develop reading in our subject to be academic and scholarly. And also spoke to a number of members of staff at REACH with top tips to support reading in your subject during sixth form. And the key takeaway from all of that was that targeted vocabulary instruction in every subject 
is one of the best bets that we can focus on as classroom teachers because every subject has its own language, ways of knowing, doing and communicating. And students knowing the vocabulary of your subject is the gateway to them accessing challenging texts in lessons and when doing independent reading. Also, anecdotally, as a maths teacher, I've definitely underestimated the importance of explicitly teaching vocab um, as when asking more conceptual questions rather than process based. So what do we do next? Questions in maths. Students are only as articulate and able to show deeper understanding when I've equipped them with the language and vocabulary to do so. And the following tips show that in the planning process, I can make changes that will improve that oracy and the reading of my students in the subject of maths. So why targeted instruction of vocabulary? I think it's best explained in three quotes. So Daniel Rigney explains the Matthew effect as essentially that while good readers gain new skills very rapidly and quickly move from learning to read to actually reading to learn new content, which sixth formers need to be able to do, poor readers get increasingly frustrated with the act of reading and try to avoid it where possible. David Didal draws attention to how the gulf between the language students speak at home and the language used in school and academia, otherwise known as academic register, lies at the core of underachievement for word poor students. And finally, this quote. We as teachers can provide the academically enriching experiences and background knowledge that students may miss if they weren't born into families who read books, read newspapers, visit museums and art galleries and go to zoos. We in our lessons and through the targeted instruction of vocabulary can help address some of these disadvantages for some of our students. So these are the four tips that I'm going to run through today. The first is in planning to decide which new words to teach implicitly or explicitly. Implicit teaching of vocabulary is when you define the word as you encounter it in the text. And Douglamov points out four techniques for implicit teaching. One is to pronounce the word together as you encounter it. To provide a simple definition of that word using words that students will definitely have prior knowledge of. To then practice that word quickly. But also to Decide some words to not define and not bother with because they're not appropriate or high leverage enough for you to spend time on. The explicit teaching of vocabulary as opposed to implicit is when you define the new word before reading the text instead of as you encounter it. Just for this example. And the decision in planning of when we should implicitly or explicitly teach new words should be based on how much prior knowledge students have regarding the word, but also the relevance and importance of the word in allowing students to access the text and reduce cognitive load when later reading it. So the first tip is in planning to consider which words you're going to teach implicitly or explicitly. Second is to identify tier two and tier three vocabulary in your subject and help that inform you which words you're going to teach 
implicitly and explicitly. So tier one words in this model are classed as everyday words that students will come across very frequently. Tier two and tier three words are words that they will come across in academic settings. Tier two are those words that are found in many different subject disciplines. So not just your subject. Examples such as examine, authority and establish may have slightly different meanings in the different subjects they are encountered. Another example close to home for me is factor. A factor in mathematics is very different to a factor in history concerning historical causation. So alongside the tier two academic words, there are then tier three, which are the words that specifically come up in your subject and no others, such as photosynthesis in science. So identifying in the planning process, key tier two and tier three vocabulary to explicitly teach will allow our students to access difficult texts in our subjects. Avril Cockhead did some interesting research on the academic words that come up the most across subject disciplines, the high incident academic word list, which is a resource worth having a look through to see almost the highest leverage words that we could teach our students, given they will come across them many times in academic literature. So the third tip, is breaking down new words with etymology and morphology. But using the etymology or the origins and roots of a word can help students remember new words and make connections between words. In this example, logia as a suffix of many words links to the study of that subject, including sociology and psychology. The EEF paper explains that up to 90% of the words encountered in science and maths have Greek and Latin origins. Morphology, as this example shows, is breaking words down to explore how the meaning of the word is built from its constituent parts. And the overall aim when breaking down new words with etymology and morphology is that we develop a word consciousness among students. So they both understand how words are built so that they can then work out new tier two words that are important to them. Final tip is then also using, when appropriate, the Freya model to introduce new vocabulary. The Freire model allows you to split a word into a simple definition, again, only using words that students will definitely know, an icon to represent that word, an example and a non-example. Let's have a look at an example for the word patriarchy. First, the definition. Then an icon, an example, and a non example. The Freire model allows students to build mental models of words so that when they come across that word in complicated text, they are more able to make meaning from that text. So, those four tips will hopefully 
build our ability to explicitly teach and implicitly teach new vocabulary so that students are more able to access complex texts in our subject, which will ultimately allow them to read more successfully and more independently outside of the classroom. Once again, those tips were choosing words in planning to teach implicitly or explicitly, identifying tier two and three vocabulary in your subject, breaking down new words with etymology and morphology, and using the Frere model when introducing new words. Hopefully in your breakout rooms, you will get the chance to talk through more examples of using those and also practice using those together. Thank you very much.